Water and dust, nugget number 12. Let's go to Exodus 32. Exodus 32, 1 through 10. Now when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people assembled about Aaron and said to him, Come, make us a God who will go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up from the land of Egypt, we don't know where the heck he's gone. We don't know what has become of him. He went up the mountain. There's flame. There's fires. There's lightning. There's voices. There's rumbling. He got eaten up by a volcano. Let's go home. Let's do something else, okay? Well, Aaron said to them, sounds good to me. Thank you, Aaron. <laughs> Tear off the gold rings which are in the ears of your wives, your sons, your daughters, and bring them to me. That's a lot of earrings, you know? You think about it. Make a calf. That's a lot of earrings. It says, uh, Tear them all off and bring them to me. Verse 3, Then all the people tore off the gold rings which were on their ears and brought them to Aaron. I don't even like to hear tearing the earrings off of your ears. I, I hope they were looped around. I hope they weren't pierced, you know, if they were just looped around in the circle. But uh, anyway, then all the people tore off the gold rings which were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. He took this from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made it into a molten calf. And they said, this is your God. Now, he didn't say that. They said that. Notice that. And the crowd said, this is your God, O Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. Now, when Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. To the Lord. Not the calf. To the Lord. So here we have multiplicity of God worship like they were used to in Egypt. Rather than going with the one God who had led them out to the made distinct among all other peoples, they said, we like this God. But we still like the ones we had back there too. And so there's this return to the Egyptian belief in a multiplicity of gods announced and confessed in this very moment. So the next day, they rose early and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. So they have offered their offerings to the living God. But it's in front of the calf. The altar is in front of the calf. And so they have celebrated the God Yahweh, but let the calf oversee it. They let the calf be above it. And so again, we've got this real blending of the pagan and the real. Okay? which was to plague Israel for most of its adult life, when you think about it. The blending of the Canaanite gods, the Philistine gods, the different gods, but always keeping one toe in the temple. You know, saying, oh yeah, well we like that God too. But there's a multiplicity here. 7 says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, Go down at once, leave the mountain, for your people whom you brought up from the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. I love the way God says your people here instead of my people. Yeah, these are your folks, okay? Uh, it's like when Carol and I are talking, I say, your daughter called. Yes, it's not my daughter this time. It's your daughter called. So, uh, so anyway, uh, they have quickly turned aside from the way which I commanded them. They have made for themselves a molten calf and have worshipped it and have sacrificed to it and said, This is your God, O Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. Don't tell me God doesn't listen to what you say. He quoted them. He word for word back what they said. Verse 9 says, The Lord said to Moses, I've seen this people, and behold, they are an obstinate people. A God of understatement, shall we say. Now, then, let me alone, that my anger may burn against them, that I may destroy them all, and I will make you a great nation. Think about what's being said. God says, I delivered them, I can kill them. 
I saved them, I can kill. How many of parents have looked at a teenager and said, I gave you birth, I can take you out? Right? We've done that sort of conversation with kids before. Well, here when we look at this, we've got Moses. We look at Moses, and Moses is going to become, according to God, the new Abraham. I have chosen Abraham and his seed to be the new covenant and to be the new children. And he says right there, I will make you a great nation. That's a direct quote from the covenant of Abraham, is it not? Direct quote. But if you think about it, as a Jew, not only is he the new Abraham, he's also the new Noah. You want to go back a little farther? He becomes the new Adam. From you will become the seed, and everything before you will be wiped out. There will be none. You will be the first. So, God is saying, remember the covenant that I made with Abraham? Yeah. I'm going to do it through you. Remember the covenant that I made with Noah? Yeah. I'm going to do it through you. Remember the covenant to multiply and replenish the earth? Yeah. I'm going to do it through you. Three covenants can be fulfilled through this one verse. And I will make you a great nation. I'm going to destroy them all and start over again. Look at Exodus 32, 11. We just read on. 11 through 14. Moses begged and entreated and threw himself literally on the ground before his God and said, O oh Lord, why does your anger burn against your people who whom you have brought out from the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians be able to brag, is what it says. Why should they be able to brag, saying, With evil intent he brought them out to kill them in the mountains and destroy them for the face of the earth. You're going to let the Egyptians brag about delivering them to kill them? You know that's what the rumor is going to be, God. The gossip back home is going to be that you, the God who did all of those plagues and all of those miracles, brought these suckers out here just to wipe them out. You were supposed to be delivering them and saving them. So he's really pleading on his face before God about the intent and the way this will be perceived, okay? Turn from your burning anger and change your mind about doing harm to your people, Moses says. Not my people. I want to remind you that they're your people, God. By the way, God... Remember Abraham and Isaac and Israel, your servants to whom you swore by yourself and said to them, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven and all this land of which I've spoken I will give to your descendants and they shall inherit it forever. Told you. It's about covenant. It's about the covenant. What's verse 14 say? So the Lord changed his mind. Pleading before our God. Pleading before our Father. So God changed his mind about the harm which he said he would do to his people. Not Moses' people. When they were Moses' people, no mercy. But when Moses reminded him, listen. Listen. I just held the stick, okay? You did the work. I held the stick over the river. I held the stick over Pharaoh. I held the stick over the sea. I held the stick over the water. I mean, you did it. These are your people. I just carried the stick for you. And God changed his mind. Moses reminding him, I can't be Abraham. There's only one. And you already made a covenant with him. You made a covenant. Let me remind you, God, of the covenant that you made. And I can't take the place of Abraham. Because that would make you a liar in the face of the world. We can't go that way. This is in defense of the covenant of God and Abraham. 
that's what the pleading here is because God's intent was to start all over again but his covenant spared the people what do you think it's like to be a part of the new covenant the new covenant which is eternal and heavenly with no earthly tabernacle if he would do it for them what is he willing to do for us do you see why the New Testament calls this a greater covenant and a better grace we have the grace but that's not the nugget yet 32 to 19 says 32 let's skip down to 19 and 20 it came about as soon as Moses came near the camp that he saw the calf and all the dancing and playing and partying and Moses' anger burned and he threw the tablets from his hands and shattered them at the foot of the mountain. He took the calf which they had made and he burned it with fire and ground it to powder and scattered it over the surface of the water and made the sons of Israel drink it. Here you go. Drink this. The punishment that Moses put upon the people. The first punishment, I believe, was God's punishment. Drink this water. The fire, the ashes, the burned calf. Mixed with water. Water and dust. Now, can I be honest with you? In my world, that's really not a punishment that's fitting to the crime. <laughs> Drink mud. I'm thinking a little more death, damnation, and punishment, aren't you? I mean, okay, you built a calf, you turned your back on me, you danced around, you worshiped another god. Drink dirt. There's something out of kilter here. There's something out of kilter about this water and dust, okay? But let's read on. 25 to 28. Exodus 32, 25 to 28 says, Now when Moses saw that the people were out of control, for Aaron had let them get out of control to be a derision among their enemies, in other words, they're being foolish in front of all the rest of the world and showing that they were worshiping other gods. What an embarrassment to their enemies. Then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Whoever is for the Lord, come to me. And all the sons of Levi gathered together. God bless them Levitical priests. God bless the Levites, okay? They all came. And he said, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Every man of you put his sword upon his thigh, and go back and forth from gate to gate in the camp, and kill every man his brother, and every man his friend, and every man his neighbor. Now we're talking. Now we're getting some real punishment, okay? This great mud stuff. We're getting real here. So... The sons of Levi did as Moses instructed it. About 3,000 men of the people fell that day. Harsh. Harsh. Not a good day for some folks. The sword and 3,000 people died. You see, I believe that the first one was the punishment of God. The second one is the punishment of Moses. Because it's Moses who stood in the gate and said, I know how to handle these people, God. You do what you're going to do. Drink mud. Okay. I Okay. Again, I think this is up here. Let's drink mud. Now, there's something very symbolic here, and again, I don't mean to embarrass anybody, but when it says to take the sword and put it on their thigh, remember thigh, and go, okay, need to lift my Can you see me? No, the camera. Can you see the camera? Okay, good. Okay, the situation here is, I'm going to take this off. We'll cut all this out. Remember that we make a covenant. 
by the hand. We make a covenant by the arm. We make a covenant by the leg. And we make a covenant by the thigh. The covenant of the hand is one of strength, primarily a military strength. Soldiers would cut the palm of the hand and the fingers to make a covenant. The arm was for the archers and for the slingers who would come together and say, we're using the strength of our arm. And this is why it's important when God says, by my arm and by my mighty hand. He's talking about his entire artillery is involved, okay? And when we, when we cut the leg, it says leg. It doesn't say thigh. When it says leg, it means cavalry or, or horses. And so my cavalry is your cavalry. But when it says thigh, it means circumcision. What was the covenant of Abraham? Circumcision. Why? Because the covenant was with your seed and that you will have children and become a nation. And so we cut what was important, we bleed what is important, and what is a part of the covenant. Here, because this is about the covenant of God and Abraham's covenant, that you lick smackers are going to be God's people whether you like it or not because of the covenant they pulled their swords from the side and pulled it around front and they walked with their swords in the front as a sign of the circumcision of God and they took their sword from its sheath not on the side where a man wears his sword but from the front where Moses told them to put it. And they slew 3,000 people to remember the blood covenant of circumcision. That was the covenant of Abraham. Okay, that's a quarter of a nugget, but it's not what we're talking about tonight, okay? <laughs> that's some insight, we'll say, but it's not where we're really at tonight. So by the sword, 3,000 fell. I don't know about you, but in my mind, that's good punishment. That's good punishment. That teaches somebody something. Aren't you glad that we live under a covenant where the wrath of God is no longer <laughs> given? Because I don't know about you, I might think it's a really good for their story, but for some reason I don't think it's very good for mine. No. Like that. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. Well... Let's go back to Moses' punishment. Water and dust are the most, or really what I think is God's punishment. It's kind of weird, right? Your punishment is I'm going to burn and break this thing down. It's going to become ash. It's going to become dirt. And now I want you to drink it. That just doesn't make sense. Look at Jeremiah 31. Jeremiah 31, 31. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, while I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. What? Yeah, the covenant with the land of Egypt and the Israelis, the Jews. My covenant which they broke. What do you think he's talking about there? Talk about this calf. Yeah. I'm going to be your people. You're going to be, I'm going to be your God. You're going to be my people. I'm going to deliver you and take you to the promised land. They broke that sucker, didn't they? So Jeremiah is, re is recounting that time, that covenant which they broke, although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and on their heart I will write it, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Amen. What a wonderful covenant. But here Jeremiah specifically states the fact that in the wilderness, God made a marriage contract with them and said, not only is this a covenant, but it is a contract. Now, in Jewish marriages, a contract is made called a ketubah. And a ketubah is a beautifully ornate, I've, I've actually brought some and shown them in church uh, many years ago, but Carol and I bought a, uh, one of those big picture books that you put on a coffee table, although this is about the size of a coffee table, the book is, okay? You put this on the back of a pickup truck, it's huge. 
But it goes back through history, through Europe, through the United States, Europe, and the Middle East, and shows these beautifully handwritten calligraphic documents of the marriage ceremony and the marriage contract between families that the Jews celebrate. And so there in the wilderness, while God was creating his ketubah on top of the mountain and giving them the commandments in stone, he was actually writing out their covenant contract. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not covet. That was the contract for the marriage. While I was writing the contract, they were being unfaithful down below. While I was m marrying them and becoming their husband, they were laying with other gods. Read 33 again. I mean 32. Not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant which they broke, although I was a husband, to them declares the Lord can you imagine being a groom who goes to the father and says it's time to make the contract the house for my bride is built the funds are gathered together for her dowry I am ready to make this official and while you're making the contract with your father and while you're signing on the dotted line you go by your fiance's house and find her in bed with a stranger. Broken the contract before it can even be made official. That's how God felt in the wilderness. God the groom, Israel the bride. What a sad moment for him it must have been. But again, I believe it was not he who went for death, but he that went for mud. Look at Numbers 5. One of the five books of Moses, the Pentateuch, where God laid out the rules for his people and said, when this happens, this is what I want you to do. When this happens, this is what I want you to do. And in Numbers 5, verse 11, then the Lord God spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, If any man's wife goes astray and is unfaithful to him, and a man has intercourse with her, and it is hidden from the eyes of her husband, and she is undetected, although she has defiled herself, and there is no witness against her, and she has not been caught in the act, if a spirit of jealousy comes over him, and he is jealous of his wife, when he, she has defiled herself, or if a spirit of jealousy comes over him, and he is jealous of his wife, when she has not defiled herself, the man shall then bring his wife to the priest and shall bring us an offering for her one tenth of an ephah of barley meal and he shall not pour oil on it nor put frankincense on it for it is a grain offering of jealousy a grain offering of memorial a reminder of iniquity then the priest shall bring her near and have her stand before the Lord and the priest shall take holy water in an earthenware vessel and he shall take some of the dust that is on the floor of the tabernacle and he will put it in the water. And the priest shall then have the woman stand before the Lord and let the hair of the woman's head hang loose and place the grain offering of memorial in her hands which is the grain offering of jealousy and the hand of the priest is to be the water of bitterness that brings a curse and the priest shall have her take an oath and shall say to the woman, If no man has lain with you, and if you have not gone astray in uncleanness, being under authority to her husband, be immune to this water of bitterness that brings a curse. If you, however, have gone astray, being under the authority of your husband, and if you have defiled yourself and a man other than your husband has had intercourse with you, then the priest shall have the woman swear with the oath of the curse, and the priest shall say to the woman, The Lord make you a curse and an oath among your people. By the Lord's making your thigh waste away, 
and your abdomen swell. And this water which brings a curse shall go into your stomach and make your abdomen swell and your thigh will waste away. And the woman will say, so be it, so be it. The curse for an adulterous wife was to drink the water of the tabernacle, or the dirt of the tabernacle, mixed in water. There was no tabernacle yet. So he took the fire of the false god and the ashes and put it in water, and they drank of it. And in so doing, God proclaimed to them an unfaithful wife. And the curse was on them. You see, there's a reason for everything in this Bible. Before numbers was ever spoken, God had already made the curse and the judgment of an unfaithful wife. Because he was their groom and they were his bride. And so God's punishment was Drink the water, take the curse, and we'll be okay. We'll be okay. And Moses came along and said, not quite. And God gave him freedom to do that. He said, you will be in charge of these people and I will let you rule these people as you see fit. But God, already knowing what he was going to do in the future to unfaithful wives, had his people drink the water and the dust. It's the punishment of an unfaithful wife. But bigger than that, it's the punishment and the covenant of children yet to come. Is that not what the Abrahamic covenant is all about? That there will be children to come? What was the curse of these people? They didn't get to go to the promised land. But who did? Their children. God kept his covenant promise through this curse that said, you are now cursed. You will not enter the land. But because of Abraham, your children will and Egypt will not be able to gossip that I was not the God who delivered his people water and dust it has a meaning amen